Before we start, any, uh, any appearance of similarity between me and the redhead guy in that video is purely coincidental, okay? Don't tell anyone that I do that. I, love, I actually love being at VBS. It's such a great thing. It's, um, it's kind of one of those things that feels familiar when you've done it a while. If you've been at Chapel Street a while, it, it feels familiar. But I hope we never forget how holy those moments are as God's changing the lives of kids in our church. So grateful for that. Well, I want to start this morning by asking you a question. And the question is this, uh, who in this room is a fan of roller coasters? Just raise your hand. How many roller coaster people? I have recently discovered that post 35, it's not advisable medically to ride on a roller coaster. I'm quite shocked by that, honestly, but uh, we went to uh, Disneyland with our kids in the spring, and I couldn't believe how physically punishing it was to ride on a roller coaster. But I used to love them, used to love them. And growing up in England, we don't have as many uh, theme parks and cool attractions as you do here in America. There was really only one theme park I knew of growing up, and it was uh, called Alton Towers. Uh, and the iconic ride at Alton Towers was a ride called the Oblivion. And I got a picture of it here. This is the Oblivion. And everybody knows about the Oblivion. Everybody knows about the Oblivion. You go to Alton Towers, and the first thing you head to is the Oblivion. And for kind of years, as a kid, it's kind of shrouded in this... Uh, this kind of iconic, like exciting, thrilling thing. So you get that, and, and I, like many of the middle schoolers that I went with the first time I went, I was excited to ride on the Oblivion. So we get there, we're getting in line, I'm looking at, at that from the side, I'm like, oh yeah, this is doable, this is gonna be awesome, right? And then I get on the ride and I see it from this perspective. That's way west. It's not fun anymore. When you sat at the top of that drop and you're looking down like that, all of a sudden all of these ideas about the oblivion that I had just went out the window and I was trying to think how I can survive this plummet into oblivion, right? And that's, that's often how we feel. Now, what I wanna talk about this morning is the idea that Jesus is a little bit like that. I've had it said about Jesus that he is one of the most well-known and at the same time, most commonly misunderstood people to have ever existed. I think that's true. I think that there is much about Jesus for believers and unbelievers alike that we can get wrong, that we can misunderstand. I think deep down in our hearts too often, we want to create a Jesus in our own image that looks like us, thinks like us, acts like us. But a face-to-face -face encounter with Jesus will always strip away your own preferences and assumptions about Jesus and will confront you with who Jesus really is. Face-to-face -face encounter will always confront you with who he really is. And the question for us as we head through this series is what will we experience when we encounter Jesus face-to-face? -face? What will we experience when we come face-to-face -face with Jesus? Will he be as thrilling as we have heard and assumed or will he terrify us? Will he be what we expect or will he be far more? I wanna look at a face-to-face -face encounter with you today from Mark's gospel, an encounter that will confront us, that will help us to frame him rightly, to, to see Jesus on his own terms, in his own words, and understand who he really is, to understand what his heart is for us, what he wants to accomplish in us. So I wanna invite you this morning to turn with me, if you have a Bible, to Mark chapter two. And I wanna read this and I wanna look at three things together this morning. I wanna look at the benefit of desperation. I wanna look at the ground of restoration and I wanna look at the proof of visitation. So let me read this to you. This is from Mark's gospel, chapter two, verses one through four to begin with. When he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. And just really quickly right there, we might read that and say, well, isn't Jesus from Nazareth? You know, why is he at home? Capernaum was kind of the home base for a lot of Jesus's ministry during the years that he was preaching the gospel and, and traveling around Israel. And so this was kind of seen as his, his home by many. Many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them. And they came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. This is such an interesting story. A crowd of people filling a house no one can get near. It kind of reminds me of the days when I was in college when uh, a new Chick-fil-A opened. Now I went to college in Texas at Baylor University. 
And it was a well-known fact to poor uh, college students that if a Chick-fil-A opened and you were one of the first 100 people in the building, you get a, a card for free Chick-fil-A for a year. And I think that this is actually still true. So there's one opening in St. Charles. If you're in need of some free sandwiches, maybe you wanna pitch some tents like these people right here, right? But that's what it would look like. Right outside the, the Chick-fil-A, there would be tents, there would be crowds, usually for at least 48 hours before it opened because you wanted to make sure you were one of the first 100 because it was something valuable to you inside. Now, it's a little bit the same in this story. Jesus is kind of picking up some steam in his ministry, and at the very least, people are starting to see something of great value in Jesus. He's an incredible teacher that teaches with authority. He is a miracle worker. Just earlier in Mark chapter one, he cleanses a leper. We talked about that a few weeks ago as a church. And so there is something of value about Jesus, and people are gathering together to find out about it. In this little home that Jesus would have been in, uh, probably when we talk about a crowd, we're not envisioning hundreds of people. A home like this, probably if you filled it wall to wall, maybe 30 people, and we're told that you know, the door's blocked, so maybe a few people outside as well, looking through the windows, looking through the doorway, but not an, not an unbelievably massive crowd, but certainly one that was preventing anyone else from getting in. And so we see at this scene, four men arrive who were carrying a friend who was paralyzed, laying down on a bed, couldn't move. And they arrive, they see that the door is blocked, they can't get into Jesus. And so they do something radical. Now this is probably the part of the story that's most familiar. If you grew up in church, you remember hearing this story. We used to talk about this story uh, to our kids when we were teaching them Bible stories. And they always called it Jesus and the Friends. And they would, they would build uh, duplo blocks and trying to imagine like luring a guy in through the roof. It was always fun doing it with them because it is kind of a fascinating story wild thing that these four men do. You see, when they see the crowd, they don't stop. They decide that they are going to get to Jesus no matter what it takes. And so they climb up onto the roof, a task that probably would have been really challenging by itself with a paralytic on a bed. And then they begin to tear a hole in the roof. Now, I don't want you to imagine a roof, how sometimes we imagine it in an ancient house, like a concrete roof. The roofs in ancient Israel, it was kind of sticks and leaves with mud. We've got a picture right here. So it was probably easier than you or I might imagine to get through that roof, but this is still pretty wild, pretty radical. If, if, if right now the roof started sprinkling down on us while I was preaching, we'd probably be kind of thrown off by it. And I want you to imagine the scene because even, even as easy as it may have been for them to do this, it probably would have taken some time to make the hole. I imagine them kind of going at it and during Jesus' sermon, there's bits of mud and leaves sprinkling down from the ceiling. And you see someone looking through the hole and say, okay, left a bit, left a bit, right a bit, as they're trying to figure this out. So the question is, is this a reasonable decision for them? Is this a reasonable choice? When you can't get in a house with Jesus, you just tear the roof off. No, of course it's not reasonable. It's desperate. It's a desperate decision. Desperation to be in the presence of Jesus, to hear from him, to engage with him, to have him speak into your life and the life of your friend. Now, I'll pause for a moment there because I wanna ask you a question. Do you have friends like that? Do you have friends who would tear the roof off for you? Who are so desperate on your behalf to bring you to Christ that they will do anything it takes to serve you, to walk with you, to bear with you? Are you a friend like that? Would you do that for those that you love? Are you desperate on their behalf to bring them to the one who can transform their life? Are you someone whose love and action and energy doesn't wilt in the face of obstacles? We're gonna see in a moment just how much this kind of friendship and love impacts Jesus, how he reacts to it. But I want you to consider the desperation of what these people are doing. The benefit of desperation is that it drives you to look for opportunities amidst your obstacles. Biblical desperation will always drive you to look for opportunities amidst your obstacles. How desperate are we in this room this morning to hear from Jesus, to be in his presence, to have him speak into our lives? If I'm honest with you, it's hard to ask myself that question because if I'm honest, I have to admit there's a lot of areas in my life 
where when I face obstacles, I pull back. When I face obstacles in my faith, when there's, there's something that's making it inconvenient or challenging, I pull back. Sometimes if Jesus, coming to Jesus means I'm gonna have to confront deeper things in my heart, things that are deep down in my soul that I don't wanna look at, I don't wanna think about, I don't wanna reflect on, I pull back. If it means I'm gonna have to engage with a neighbor that I dislike, who's wounded me, who's offended me, who's troublesome and bothersome, then I, I pull back. If it means I'm gonna to have to change my schedule and my commitments, rearrange the way that I'm living my life, I pull back. If it means uncomfortable friendships or putting myself in a vulnerable place, I pull back. That is not desperation, that's passivity. That's not a desperation to be in the presence of Jesus, to hear from him, to engage with him any way you can, however you can, that is passivity. And the truth is, whenever I face obstacles, whenever you face obstacles, there is a tendency in us to pull back, to revisit old habits, to cool off in our commitments. And we can even end up questioning God's love for us, not because he's moved, but because we have pulled back. And yet what Jesus' words to us are, what his invitation to us is, says this in Matthew 11, come to me, all who labor and who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come to me, is what he says to us. It's what he says to us this very morning, whether he said it to us before or a hundred times before, today he's still saying to us, come to me, all who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Are you desperate for rest? Does your soul ache for it? Do you feel it week to week in your job, in your parenting, in your marriage, in your relationships around you? Does your soul ache for a rest that you have not found anywhere else? Sometimes mine does. And so here in the pages of Mark 2, God is confronting me. He's confronting us to become desperate, to have a faith that makes us desperate. To not see blocked doors as a reason to pull back, but to seek whatever opportunity we can to engage with him, to be in his presence, to hear his voice, to hear his words, and let him give us the rest that we so desperately need. That is what these four men saw. And so they climbed on a roof and they started tearing it off. Do not settle for a passive faith. Ask God for a faith like these friends, a desperate faith because a desperate faith will bring you face to face with the one who can restore you. And that's what we see next in this story. We see the ground of restoration. Now, I, uh, I struggled to believe I was a sinner until I got to the second window of McDonald's one day and realized that they had put mayo on my bagger instead of keeping it off. And all of a sudden I realized there's something deeply wrong with me because the anger that I had because my order was wrong was unbelievable. And that, that's, that's true in a lot of corners of our culture, isn't it? We like to get our order right. When we show up at a store, when we shop online, we want to get what we asked for. And what's odd about this story is it doesn't seem like this man gets what he asked for. Because when the friends lure him through the hole that they've made in the roof, we are told this, that when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. Now, does Jesus get the order wrong? Because presumably if a paralytic shows up at the house of Jesus, he's showing up because he doesn't want to be a paralytic anymore. He's come in that Jesus, this miracle worker might heal him. And yet Jesus sees him and immediately says, son, your sins are forgiven. Doesn't this man need compassion instead of a conversation about sin? I mean, is Jesus that one friend who always just kind of says that one thing and wrecks the whole moment? Why is he talking about sin? Why is he saying this? It's because Jesus has a deeper compassion than we do. He has a more profound compassion than we do. He sees something that we don't see. He sees this man's deepest need. He sees that the ground of his restoration is not only physical healing, but reconciliation with the one who made him through the forgiveness of sin. You know, Jesus knows our needs far better than we do. He knows our aches. And a lot of the time when we come to him, he is going to show us things 
that we didn't expect him to. He is going to re reveal things, open up things that we didn't expect him to, things we weren't looking for because he knows what's underneath them. Paul Tripp, one of my favorite pastors, he said this. He said, no matter what I face in the brokenness of this world, my greatest problem exists inside of me, not outside of me. Do you believe that? Our culture often says the opposite. We love to point the finger at, at different things and say, there's the problem. This is what it is. It's this situation over here. It's, it's this person over there. That's, that's the problem. But the greatest impediment to life and thriving and joy and peace, it isn't this person over here. It isn't this situation over there. It's not the economy. It's not what's being taught in our schools. It's not the broken relationships that we experience in our family. It is certainly not the political situation of our country. It is the pervasive and relentless gnawing of sin inside of our own hearts the sin that twists us out of shape and buries us in a compulsive need to create our own meaning and purpose. The sin that buries us under a fear that we are not valuable, we are not worth anything, and so we need to create that for ourselves. There is a malfunction deep in the fabric of who we are because of our turning away from God. And that is what Jesus sees. He sees that no matter how much external situations change and relationships change, if the deeper problem isn't dealt with, we won't have lasting joy. What Jesus sees is a man not only in physical paralysis, but in spiritual paralysis. And he loves him so deeply. Jesus is, is so devoted to this man's restoration that he refuses to fix one problem and leave him with a far greater one. Some of us are in a state of profound spiritual paralysis because we are pleading with Jesus to ignore our deeper needs in favor of our desires. J.G. Greer says, many people don't realize that their deepest desires often do not match up with their deepest needs. And the truth is this morning, we need to realize that you and I, we don't know ourselves the way that Jesus knows us. We do not understand ourselves the way that Jesus understands us. And praise God for that. Because you know what that makes Jesus? That makes Jesus an effective savior. That he can see the things that we can't, that he knows the things that we don't know. Isn't that what we need in a savior? In my uh, favorite book in the Narnia series, The Voyage of the Dawn Treader, there's a story about a young British boy, Eustace Scrub. I just wanna assure you, real British people don't have names like Eustace Scrub. But in this story, Eustace is a very greedy young boy. And uh, he uh, ends up turning into a dragon because of his greed. Horrible situation. He's crying about it. He's isolated from his, his friends. And he's, he's trying desperately to tear his own scales off in the story. And this is a really interesting moment where Aslan comes to him and, and as he's trying to tear off the scales, Aslan says to him, you're going to have to let me go deeper. And Aslan sinks his claws and reaches this place deep inside of Eustace. And Eustace describes it later in the book as being so painful. And yet he reached something that Eustace couldn't reach. Jesus sees our deeper problem but he doesn't, he doesn't just see it. I want you to listen to what he says to uh, the, this, this paralytic and the, and the others gathered around him. He turns to the paralytic and he says a string of words that are so full of compassion. He says, son, your sins are forgiven. Every word in that sentence is saturated with compassion and mercy for the man that was lying on that bed. Just think about those words, just briefly with me. First, son. The first words that Jesus utters to the paralytic is he's lowered through a roof. Imagine this man, a man that was probably ostracized in a lot of ways from people around him. We don't know exactly what he thought about himself, what others thought about him, but we can imagine it's probably not good. And yet Jesus' first words to him are, son. Tender words. Giving him an identity. Do you know that one of the biggest problems you and I have is an identity problem? We don't know who we are. We don't know whose we are. 
And here right now, Jesus offers identity to this man. He says, son. Tim Keller says, the only person who dares wake up a king at 3 a.m. for a glass of water is a child. We have that kind of access to God. Jesus is affirming in this man, you can come to me. And then he says, your sins, not just sins in general, but your sins. Not the world's sins, not somebody's sins over here, but your sins. And this is important because many of us might be tempted to think, or at least it, maybe it's just me, but I often think, well, maybe God can forgive Dave over here because he's a pretty good guy, and so he's willing to give him a pass on some of his sins, but not me, not Andrew, because if he looked at what I did, the things that I've said, the things that I've thought, I can't be forgiven. My sins are a bigger problem than this person over here or that person over there. And yet Jesus looks at this man and says, no, your sins, not just sins in general, but your sins, I see you and your sins are forgiven. And I love that he says are forgiven because again, many of us struggle with that. Are meaning present reality, meaning right now in this moment. Many of us think, well, maybe we'll be forgiven one day in the future. It's, it's something that's coming. We've got to kind of wait it out and do our best in this life. And, and then one day we might be forgiven. But Jesus is saying to this man, no, right now, in this moment, in this very present moment, you are forgiven. What you have in Christ is not laid away in some heavenly bank account for you to access one day in the future. I want you to know that all that Christ has is available to you right now, today, this very moment, through his spirit that makes it available to you. Christ is not about one day in the future. Christ is about today. And those last words, who can forget those? Forgiven, wiped clean, removed. How many of us think, well, Jesus tolerates us, right? He puts up with us because he's good and he's kind and he's, he's compassionate, so he, he tolerates us. No, you are forgiven. Your entire record of everything you've ever done wrong, every misstep you've ever taken, every thought you've ever engaged in is wiped away as far as the east is from the west is what the scriptures tell us. It doesn't exist anymore. Jesus doesn't have some videotape of you in heaven of all the bad things that you've done. It is gone. It is erased. My soul aches for words like this. And every day of my life, because of Jesus, God speaks those words to me. And he speaks those words to you. The real question this morning is whether or not Jesus can deliver on his words. It's a great idea, isn't it? A great, wonderful idea that we can be sons and daughters of God, that we can be children of God, that we can be forgiven, that we can experience this life from Christ, this healing and restoration from Christ. Question is, can he deliver it? Or is it just a great idea? I think for the longest time in our culture, people would ask of Jesus and the gospel message, is it true? But more and more people are asking, does it work? And Jesus answers that in this encounter too. Read this with me, Mark 2, verses 6 through 12, this last section of this. He says, Now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, Why does this man speak like that? Why does he speak like that? Why does this man speak like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they had thus questioned within themselves, said to them, why do you question these things within your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise, take up your bed and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed and go home. And he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all so that they were all amazed and glorified God saying, we have never seen anything like this. The scribes are the first people in this story to really understand what Jesus is implying about himself in this little event. He is making an extraordinary claim about himself. He is saying, you have not only been visited by a great teacher or a great healer, you have been visited by God in the flesh. Now, why is that? Why do they jump to that conclusion? Why do they, they think that way? They are saying, why does he speak like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? And they're right. Because all sin is against God. The only one who can forgive sin is God. 
And so for Jesus to stand there and saying, I forgive you, he is implying I am God. There's a great scene, if you ever watched The Chosen in the first season, they kind of, they depict this scene. And there's a moment where they, they kind of play this out and the scribes, they say, well, who can forgive sins but God alone? Or Jesus kind of acknowledges that they're thinking that. And he says, good point. Because Jesus is being very clear about who he is. He's leaving no mistake, no room for a mistake about how he views himself. This is why C.S. Lewis, very famously, one of my favorite quotes of C.S. Lewis says this. He says, I'm trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God, but let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that option open to us, and he did not intend to. You'll hear a lot of things said about Jesus, but what Jesus says about himself is unmistakable. He's not just a good teacher. He's not just a miracle worker. He is God. And Jesus didn't just claim it. He proves it. He tells them and he asks this odd question. He says, which one is easier to say your sins are forgiven or to say, rise, pick up your bed and walk? And it's one of those great questions that shuts everybody in the room up. We were uh, planning this as a preaching team this week, thinking about this passage, talking about it. And uh, I think it was Pastor Brian mentioned, he said, which is easier? And so we kind of all sat thinking and we were trying to think, is it this one? Is it? And, and Pastor Brian simply made the point, everybody in the room was silent as we thought about it. Because it's a really hard question. Jesus is great at questions like that that just make us stop and think. And probably in the middle of that thinking, while these scribes are trying to figure out, well, what's the answer? Jesus just says, so that you can know, so that you can understand that what I have inferred about myself is 100% true, rise, pick up your bed and walk. And the paralytic gets off the bed and walks. Everybody's jaws would have hit the ground. An amazing display of authority and power. But what I want you to understand this morning is not just the display of power, but what that display of power cost Jesus. Because there was a cost to what he did in Mark 2. In this moment, Jesus is taking his first steps towards the cross. Because to forgive this man he must absorb the penalty of the sin that he's forgiving. Because forgiveness isn't about just sweeping things under the rug and ignoring that they've happened. Forgiveness is always the absorbing of a debt. Think for me this morning, if you will, to understand this a little better. If I went and borrowed one of your vehicles this morning and took it for a little bit of a ride around Geneva, ended up getting in an accident and, and wrecking your car, and I came back and I said, I am so sorry, please forgive me. You can do one of two things. You can say, no, Andrew, I don't forgive you. You wrecked my car. You're gonna pay for that. Or you can say, I forgive you. But the instant that you say you forgive me, what are you doing? You're absorbing the debt of fixing that car on yourself. You're saying, because I forgive you, I will shoulder the debt of what it's gonna cost to fix what you've wrecked. That's what Jesus is doing. Every time that Jesus forgave someone, he knew it came at cost to himself because he was absorbing the debt of sin onto himself. To forgive this man, Jesus would have to take the debt upon himself and he would have to pay for it. Because the scriptures tell us, Hebrews 9, 22, quoting from the Old Testament, indeed under the law, almost everything is purified with blood and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. And Paul goes on to tell us in Colossians 2, you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses. And how? How did he forgive us? By canceling the record of debt that stood against us with his legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. It wasn't just a list of sins. It wasn't just kind of a code that he, he put on the, on the cross and nailed it there. It was his own son. Jesus in this face-to-face -face encounter proves he is not only the one who sees our deepest need, he is the only one who can deal with it. He is the only one willing to take it upon himself and deal with it. Think about how calmly and coolly Jesus says these words, knowing what's behind them, knowing the cost behind them, and he says them anywhere. That's how willing Jesus is to pay whatever cost to forgive you 
to bring you back to the one who loves you and made you. There are many of us in this room ravaged by the weight of sin around us and in us. We live in a world where we feel it every moment of every day. And aren't you aching for someone who can do something about it? When you watch the debates on TV, when you hear about the things going on in the news, when you look around the world, aren't you aching for someone who can finally do something about it? There is someone who can. There is someone who has, and his name's Jesus. We keep looking for solutions everywhere, but in the one who has already proven to us that he has come. Jesus is not good news just because he's a great idea, but because he is a real solution. He's not good news because he's a great idea, but because he is a real solution, a true savior. Our faith is not built on a great idea or a good philosophy. Think about what C.S. Lewis said. Jesus has intentionally left out that option for us so that we can understand we don't just have another teacher. We don't just have another healer. We have a true savior, a dependable anchor for our souls. And we are here this morning, worshiping with the songs that we've sung, celebrating this man, Jesus Christ, because he has done for us what we could never do for ourselves. And he has offered us what we cannot find anywhere else, but in his hands. We have found one who says, I will deal with your deeper problem. I will carry your deeper burdens. I will heal your deepest wounds. I will be for you what you need that you might stand up from your spiritual paralysis and walk in a life that you've never experienced before. We have the opportunity this, this morning to come to this one. My hope is this morning that you would come face to face with him for the first time or for the hundredth time or for the thousandth time, but to come and see him as he really is and let that renew you, strengthen you, encourage you let that grow in you a desperation to be in his presence, to hear his voice, to encounter his grace. And I'll just finish by saying this. You might feel that there is no room for you with this Jesus. Even after hearing these things and, and reflecting on these things, you might feel there's no room for me. But I want you to understand that part of the, the wonder of this story, it isn't just about four friends who tore the roof off for the one that they loved because there is another one who has done what they did to far greater measure, because Jesus, Jesus is the one who tore the roof off to bring you to the Father, to lure you into his presence, that you might find grace and help in time of need. My encouragement to you is that you have a friend who has torn the roof off for you. His name's Jesus. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for this chance to come to the one who has tore the roof off for us, the one who sees our deepest needs, the one who in our desperation has had us and has taken upon himself the weight, the burden, the ache of all that is broken in this world and in our own hearts. Father, we are here today to hear from him, to know him better, to be transformed by him. Lord, give us grace to see him as he really is and to come to the one who has called us. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. I wanna thank you for joining us for worship today. Our heart as a church is to constantly be a place, to be in the presence of this one who has said these things to us, invited us to come. Anyway, we can pray for you. I wanna let you know there are people available who would love to pray with you, encourage you. We're not here just to sing, simply to hear from God's word, but to let him come and meet with us. And so if you need that, please come. We'd love to pray with you. But this morning, let me leave you with this benediction from the book of Hebrews chapter four. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Jesus, the son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. It's in the name of Jesus that we go, amen.